open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. It will be the text where you are in this morning. It's a, it's a joy and it's, a, it's also a privilege to, to preach this morning. The last time I preached was when I came in view of a call. And it's been a whirlwind uh, from that time until now. But we, I was telling somebody out in the hall, we were finally putting family photos back up on the wall and feeling like we're not living in a hotel, but we're at a place that we can call home. So we appreciate that, church family. This morning we're going to be looking at the parable of the sower. This comes about halfway through the earthly ministry of Jesus. And this parable comes in proximity to two other parables. One that comes before it that's very agrarian-like, one that comes after. And you could see where Jesus draws these metaphors, these illustrations, perhaps even seeing somebody, a farmer in his field, sowing seed. Uh, the one that comes prior to that is about the tree, the good tree, which produces good fruit. And the one that comes after is a parable about the, the enemy of a man who took we- weeds and sowed them in his neighbor's field. And the man said that we need to let the, let the harvest grow up. And when we harvest, we'll separate the wheat from the tares and burn the tares up. Uh, Jesus did this often. He, he spoke in parables to the, the people he taught. And which we're going to unpack what that is in, in a second. This one, in Matthew 13, what's so striking, what's so interesting, Matthew 13, verse 1, it said, The great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat, and he sat down, and the crowd stood on the beach. And Jesus was wildly popular in the first century, and not always for the right reasons. People didn't always follow Jesus for the right reasons. Aside from John the Baptist, he's the only person in almost 400 years, over 400 years, to emergency notice any, anything like a prophet. His works were so many that the end of the gospel of John, it says that if we were to record everything that Jesus did, there, wasn't, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole world. So what we have here, the gospels, is just the mere highlights of Jesus' ministry. And you imagine a person that could, day after day, heal a person after another, one after another, day in and day out cast out demon one after another he would defy the open openly the authorities of the day taught with authority in the synagogues and in the temple claiming greater authority than than the stakeholders of the day whatever you believe about jesus whether you believe he is lord or not jesus is undeniably fascinating Jesus had a celebrity status of the first century that often invited judgment from him when he told the Jews that I have sheep of another fold and you're not of my sheep. Is when they kept following him, like, please keep performing miracles. Feed us again, Jesus. They wanted the show to continue. And this celebrity status often caused him to be exhausted so Jesus would have to withdraw and go to the Father, be in fellowship with him by himself. I remember in Luke 8 when I, when I preached the first time with the woman with the bleeding and the crowds are pressing in on Jesus and the very word for press is that of a wine press which crushes grapes. It's that kind of celebrity status that Jesus has. And he sees, and in, in here in Matthew 13, verse 1, he sees the crowds coming and he sees the impossibility of being able to teach them, but he has his purposes in mind. So he boards a boat, pushes off the shore a little bit, crowds aren't able to come near and it creates a distance between himself and the crowd that allows himself to be able to teach. And notice that t- detail. It says that he sat down and the crowd stood. This is the posture. This is the teaching position of rabbis in ancient Judaism. The pupils would sit, excuse me, the pupils would stand while the rabbi would sit down. So whatever comes next, Matthew is drawing our attention to, to the fact that we're seeing the teaching ministry of Jesus at work. There are other times that the kingly nature of Christ is expressed. When Christ enters into Jerusalem triumphantly, we see that kingly nature. When he uh, says in Matthew 24, surely not one stone will be left upon another, foretelling the future of the destruction of the temple uh, of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD. That was the prophetic nature that was on full display. When he healed the leper and he said, be clean, and for the first time in human history, a person was not made unclean, we see the priestly expression of Christ. But here, here we have the teaching ministry 
of Jesus set before us. And so what comes na- next is the master instructor to school the crowds, to school you this morning. And it says that he told them many things in parables. A parable is perhaps an unfortunate word in the English because if literally in the Greek, parable is parable. It's just a transliteration. It'd be like saying, hey, what is what is airplane mean in Spanish? Aeroplano. I didn't define anything for you. It doesn't mean anything without, without unpacking it a bit more. Many of the parables are one of the first times we see parables ever in scriptures in Jesus' ministry. Uh, there is parable-like language in the Old Testament. Many of the prophets use symbolism. They use metaphors. But what was different about what the prophets did in the Old Testament is that Jesus, without him explaining, interpreting the parable, without him making it known, the meaning remains hidden from us. And it remained hidden from some of them. So a parable, it's, it's like a proverb. It's like a figure of speech. It's, it's an illustrative story. It's a parable. It's an extended metaphor, extended simile. Now notice, we're going to look at verses about 1 through 9. And then there's a gap. And then Jesus explains, he, he interprets the parable of the sower a few verses later. In about verses, verses 18. Read along with me at verse 3. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell among the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, and they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell in the good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. The meaning of this parable is completely hidden to us if Jesus does not disclose it to us. We would, we would get parts of this, but without that comparison, you're like, what are you saying this is like, Jesus? We wouldn't know. We would understand a sower sowed seed. I get that. Okay got a bag he's got a seed he's tossing it okay but what's that referring to we understand that different seed responds to different kind of soil we we get that we understand if i overwater something or i don't water something that something's going to happen to that seed that's clear enough but some of the striking features of the text fall are in verse eight he says that other seed fell on the good soil and produced grain some hundred some 16 some 30 fold and then this last statement is a bit puzzling too he says he who has ears let him hear What's going on here? Well, first of all, by Jesus telling this parable, he has two functions. He has two rationales, two purposes. The first is for the outsiders, those along the shore. And the second is for him and his disciples to disclose to. He moves what's what's clear in the metaphor, we understand what so is, to what's unclear. What does it mean? So why, why is he doing this? Why is he using parables and not telling the people on the shore, but he tells the disciples? Well, I believe it's because during the earthly ministry of Christ, he has this increasing opposition to him as he is headed toward the the cross. And there's even hints of judgment within his language and that he doesn't reveal to some of these people what he's talking about. But at, at different times, Jesus revealed different things. And I think this was to keep pace with him ushering the kingdom on Christ's timing. Think about this in Luke 5, when Jesus healed the leper, And he says, don't tell anyone. And the leper went out and told people. And Jesus wasn't able to perform any miracles there because the crowds came and overwhelmed him. Uh, That feature is so puzzling. People are like, why wouldn't you want him to tell people that it's been technically labeled the messianic secret? And in essence, it's the messianic secret. Why did Jesus do it? It's because he, he would pump the brakes on people that wanted to accelerate him to his throne. So think about in John 6 when it says that perceiving that the crowds wanted to come and make him king by force, he departed, departed from them. At other times in, in Luke 4, uh, his wit- witness was being slandered by a demon. Or it said, who are you, son of the most high? Have you come to torment us before the time? And he essentially told the demon, shut up. Same thing happened in Acts when a couple of the apostles are being followed by the the demon-possessed woman. And for several days, they're saying, hey, these are are apostles. They serve Jesus. 
and slandering the witness and eventually turn around and they said, come out of her, shut up, be quiet, stop slandering the very word of God, stop slandering our own witness. And when the crowds were too demanded and he told, he, that's when he told the leper to be quiet. He pumped the brakes on that. It, was, it wasn't until the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4 4 says that Christ came in the flesh. And I believe that's what's happening here. He tells the parable to this original audience, discloses it to the, to the disciples. And in the fullness of time, church body, you are receiving now what was hidden to that crowd. Think about that. What was secretly made known to the disciples is now made known to you because the Holy Spirit inspired men and drove them along as they wrote Scripture. And we have to us the very words of God, and we can look at Jesus' interpretation. So we're going to unpack four questions. Who is a sower? Who is a seed? What do the soils represent? And lastly, how do I hear? The big idea of this text is about the parable being about the kingdom and its varied reception. And it goes to highlight that fourth question, how do I hear? Now read along with me. Look at verse 18 in your Bibles with me. Read Jesus' interpretation of the parable. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for this, what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but he cares for the world and the deceitfulness of riches that choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil... This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears much fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another sixty and another thirty. The sower in this parable is not restricted to Jesus sowing the seed. Rather, it's anyone who carries that seed. And in fact, this is actually where we get the very word for, for TV and radio broadcast. It comes from sowing seed where they broadly cast the seed, broadly throw it into a field. That seed itself is the gospel message. It is indiscriminately tossed to all kinds of people, to all people. And take notice of the yield. The harvest produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Jesus is not saying that this seed produced a little bit, quite a bit, and then a lot. He's, it's not a Goldilocks. It was just a little bit and some was too much and this was just right. Rather, he's saying even the smallest amount, 30 fold, Imagine harvest this next year, and there was, it was 30 times what they had last year. It's, it's unfathomably huge. It's ridiculously big. Imagine a harvest of 3,000%. There's something about the seed that carries much power. In fact, that's the gospel. It's so powerful that where it bears fruit, it reaps a harvest. And all of that, it sets up a context for this, that the parable, even though, even though the seed is indiscriminately tossed, even though the seed is so powerful, it isn't it solely centered on the sower nor the seed. Rather, it's about the kind of soil we are. That's where the parable centers on. So we're going to walk through these categories of hears. And while I do, I want you to examine your own heart. I want you to take charge seriously when Jesus says here, he who has ears, let him hear. Which listener are you? Which soil describes you, church family? Which category of here are you? A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Verse 19, Jesus explains, I mean, this way, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown at heart. This is what was sown along the path. This is the first soil. Friends, if, if you do not bear fruit, this is a solemn place of warning and examination to ask. Have I heard the gospel and positively responded? How does it, how is it that the seed is snatched away? Well, it's through distraction, 
It's through procrastination. It's through false beliefs. It's through false teachings. For example, culturally, many believe that they are saved because they simply attend church, whether regularly or semi-regularly. And friends, that, that no more makes you a Christian than going to a garage will make you a car. Many believe that they are saved because they've been baptized, but the waters that we pour for baptism are not magic. They don't change you. It's, it's a picture of what has happened in your life. It's a picture of what Christ has already done to a person. Or your good works at the end of your life, going before Christ, they're not going to outweigh your bad. And that would be terribly, that would be awful to want to believe that. If you could gain your salvation by what you could do, you would lose your salvation by what you could do. And then we have the, the confusing language that sometimes we, sometimes we use this vernacular and it's just a bit misleading or it's imprecise and it's led some to believe that they're saved and they're not. For example, we, we still use this today and I don't want to be too heavy handed, but we'll say, I asked Jesus into my heart. I want to pause for a second. We're just singing those words about a heart transformation. Friends, Jesus doesn't come into your heart. Your heart is a heart of stone without Christ. That's what it says in Ezekiel. It says the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? It's desperately sick. It's not just sick, it's dead. Jesus doesn't come into your heart. You need a heart transplant. When we say that I accepted Jesus, okay, I know what we mean by that. And I don't want to press on you too hard if you accepted Jesus. But friends, the Lord of glory, you're, do we really want to say, I accept you, Jesus? I accept you? No, friends, you, you must come broken to the cross. You must respond in faith to Christ. Now, I know what we mean when we say that. Well, the person is saying, it's like, yeah, I put my faith and trust in what he's done. Or when we say, I pray to prayer. Listen, again, I don't want to beat up on this too much, but when we say the prayer, I always walk through the sinner's prayer when I was a child. There needs to be some kind of response, but merely saying words it's not magic. It doesn't just change you. If you say a prayer and then never attend church again, never bear fruit, what's going on inside of your heart? I believe that those are some of the ways that that seed is snatched away. So I'm not asking if you're culturally Christian. I'm not asking if you play Christian. I'm not asking if, you, if you're president at a church function or two. I'm not asking if you were once baptized or if you bowed your head to believe in God, I'm asking if you bear fruits in keeping with repentance. None of these things matter. None of these things have saved you unless you've repented of your sins. And how do you know if you've repented? Well, in keeping with the analogy Christ provides is this. Do I bear fruit? Is my life characterized by the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, Galatians 5 says. And not just individually, but corporately. Do I bear fruit? It says in that passage of Galatians that the fulfillment of the law is found in a love for neighbor. That's born out of a love for Christ. Do you love Christ? Do you desire to follow him? And in which case, if you bear fruit, it will happen because you love Christ. You can't fake the fruit. Or is my life characterized by the opposite? Am, am I living in sin? And friends, you, you cannot live openly in sin and say, I know him. First John 1 John 1.8 says that if you say you have no sin, you keep on sinning. The truth is not in you. And you make him to be a liar. You cannot be indifferent to Christ and say, I know him. You, you cannot say your hope is with Christ with any meaning, and like the, the proverb in uh, Proverbs 26, like a dog returned to your vomit, returning to your sin again and again and again. Young men and women, you will be leaving home soon, and you're going to discover this soon, whether this is you or not. When the common grace constraints of family and friends or relationships are lifted, who are you? When your family and your, your classmates and everybody in your everyday relationships in the town where everybody knows you and recognizes you wherever you go, when they're gone, who will you be? Are you going to be one that is known by your fruit? Or will you roll in your sin? 
as Martin Luther who said, our works do not produce our righteousness. Rather, our righteousness produces our works. To put that differently, you can't fake the crop. You can't fake fruit. He who has ears, let him hear. The second soil, the, the rocky ground, verse 5, it says, Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, in verse 20, 21, and as for what was sown in the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately he falls away. There are many indeed who profess a faith in Christ, there are many that receive the gospel initially with joy, and Jesus tells us somberly that that seed that only endured, endured for a little while. Because friends, mere joy is not the same as faith. Just mere emotion and excitement, those are often associated with genuine faith, but they're not sufficient, not by themselves. You, you must bear fruit. This is the person who initially they jumps in 100% for Christ. They're on fire for a season, but after a while they just fizzle out, stop seeing them. Or if they continue to white knuckle it and come to church, you remember a time like, yeah, I remember when that person was so exciting. Now they're just bitter. I don't really like getting cornered in the parlor by them because they're just angry and they're just complaining. Do you bear fruit? I mean, guys, I get it. When, if, if you haven't been transformed by the gospel, I, I, would not wanna, I wouldn't want to be here if I did not know Christ. I wouldn't want this sum of religious actions in an institution and in a building on this weekly rhythm. Why, why would you want to come if you don't know Christ? I get that. This soil represents the kind of person who easily strays when their supposed faith makes them feel uncomfortable. When that social or that societal or political pressure is on, this is, the, this is not the soil that survives. It dwindles. And I don't know if we're able to receive this or hear this in, in our country, in our context, because largely in the United States, persecution is discomfort. Now, there have been people who've lost their businesses for taking a stand for Christ. There have been people threatened, like, you need to submit a transcript of your sermon to the city government. There's been attempts for that to happen. But speaking in a, in a global context of the church, our persecution in the United States pales. Think about this. The church in Nigeria, I don't know if anybody has been following this. The church in Nigeria has been coming under increasing pressure. There were hundreds in the last few weeks where, where Muslims entered into the, into the sanctuary, wiped out entire congregations firebombed on Easter, completely killed under that oppression, shot, bombed, wiped out. Friends, that's, a, that's the soil. This is the soil that endures and it, which is even capable of withstanding this persecution as the last soil. This soil dwindles under that. Christ said in Luke 9.23, if anybody wants to follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me. He didn't mean that just symbolically. He didn't just mean that like, yeah, I got, I, got a rough, I got a hard day ahead of me. I got to put in a lot of hours. He meant join the death march for many people will die on account of Christ. We never really know the, the kind of person we are until the, the pressure is on. The best and the worst parts of your character, my character, reveal themselves when we're under pressure. And so it's hard to know. If somebody walked in right now and put a gun to my head, would I deny Christ? If an atheistic professor said you're going to fail this and fail out of college, if, if you don't affirm this worldview or this, this viewpoint, would you care? I don't know. If you could answer in your heart of hearts and say, yeah, I think I would, then, then friends, it's, it's clear you're not a Christian. And the mandate is clear, you need to repent. You need to come to Christ. You need to put your faith in Christ. In Colossians it, said, it says, be rooted in Christ. When young men and women, you are leaving home and you'll be put in a context soon where you might realize, I'm not saved. 
this described me when I left home. I, I could have told you I was a Christian. I could have tell, told you the gospel, spit out a few verses, but I went into an, a largely on-Christian context of the military, and the pressure was on. I, pretty soon, I wasn't fooling anyone, and I wasn't fooling myself. I, I could say those words, I'm not a Christian. I don't want the things of Christ. I don't want the church. I want my sin. So I, th- I thought my zeal, at one point in time that I had after a youth conference, I thought it was real, but it didn't last. It didn't endure. I had been plain Christian. I had been hiding. I had been in plain sight. I had the church fooled. I had myself fooled. And friends, if, if that describes you, if you receive the gospel with joy, but you bear no fruit, you're not a Christian. Did you, did you once make a profession of faith, but you, you found it burdensome? You found it mundane? boring, thoroughly uninteresting, undesirable to ever want to read the Word of God? Are you constantly serving, maybe? Volunteering, but doing so either out of the hope that it'll keep you saved or that it'll save you, or because this is what I'm supposed to do, but I don't want to do it? Are you trying to win God's approval? And friends, you could spend a lifetime serving Christ and a lifetime enslaved to your sin. You could have served on 10 committees in the church, put hundreds of hours into volunteering. And if you neglect the spiritual disciplines of reading God's word and praying, this this may be a harsh message for you because if you would rather do the work of being on a committee and never read your Bible, your, your affections are completely inverted. And so the way Al Mohler put it, I love this. He says, don't just do something, stand Stand on the word of God. Stand there, be rootly, be deeply rooted in God. Examine your life and ask this, do I bear fruit that is in keeping with repentance? He who has ears, let him hear. The third soil, the the soil among the thorns, verse 7, other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. And as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, verse 22, but cares for the world and the deceitfulness of riches, riches, and it chokes the word, and it proves unfruitful. While the last soil speaks to a context of persecution much more than our own, this one definitely, this soil defines our materialistic context. It definitely describes what we're saturated in. Many people hear the gospel, and in hearing of the truth of the inheritance laid up for us through Christ, for the riches of those that love God, hearing of those people that are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And in the words of 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those that love them. They hear those words and walk away as one who sees themselves in a mirror forgets their image. They hear of the unlimited treasures of Christ and they would rather seek treasures elsewhere. Our our culture is saturated in materialism. We have almost anything to our door within two days through Amazon Prime and we complain when the TV doesn't come from Spokane, Washington. It gets here in three days. Oh, I'm so oppressed. We have more than one grocery store in town. We have more than one butcher in town. Only three I have to go to Chickasha to go to Aldi? I haven't gone to Chickasha to go to Aldi. We have more powerful computers in our pockets than the brightest minds of the 1950s could have imagined. And we complain, ah, I'm out of data. We have an excess of food, an excess of resources and recreational options and lakes to go to. And the human heart cries out more. We often approach materialism as if it's like magic. If I get the formula right, if I, if I just owned a house, I would be complete. If I had the right furniture and decor after I bought the house and I find I'm not, in, I'm not complete, maybe then I'd be complete. And then maybe it's if I had the right car, furniture, and house, and neighborhood, friends, clothes, hobbies, movie collection, maybe after all that I would be complete. Maybe if it's if I had the walnut built-in bookshelves, the brand new Ford F-150 pickup that turns into a spaceship, paid off a five-bedroom house with the pool, the heart still cries out more. And 
don't be fooled. You could be lacking all those things. Be like, I, I'll, I've never owned that much. I'll never own that much. And you could still have a heart that is bent toward greed. You could never have the riches of the world and still str- and struggle from paycheck to paycheck and have a greedy heart. It's not ultimately about how much money you have or the things you have. It's about who or what you serve. It's what, what you devote your time, your thoughts, and your affections, and your money towards. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 19, 24, it's more difficult, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man enter the kingdom of God. And why? It's because when you collect idols, they demand sacrifice, and they choke out the gospel message. Now, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying if you have been blessed by God and you have money that you are unsaved. That's not what I'm saying. To whom much is given, much is required. What I'm saying is, is this. I'm coming down to what Christ says. Do you prove to be unfruitful? The rich man who has much fruit is saved. The rich or poor man who bear no fruit are not saved. Young men and women, you are on the cusp of leaving home or preparing to leave home in a few years. And you will have the opportunity to pursue your heart's desires. Is your desire for Christ or is it for the world? Are your hopes and anticipations built up for growing in Christ or is it in this life? Is it in success? Do I and your family want you guys to be blessed? Yes, we want you to. Do we want you to succeed at your endeavors? We do. We also want to warn you the American dream is perhaps one of the greatest lies that damns more men than it has aided. Your hope should not be in success more than it is for your treasure that is laid up in heaven. Matthew 6, 19-20 says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither, wrath, neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves do not break in and steal. Oh, young people, God loves you and has a difficult plan for your life. Friends, are you choked out by the distractions of the world? Or are you bearing fruit and keeping up the repentance? He who has ears, let him hear. The fourth soil, the final soil, it's it's a good soil. Verse 8 and verse 23. Other seed fell on the good soil and produced grain some hundredfold. Some 16, some 30, verse 23. And as for what was sown in the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields it, in one case a hundredfold, and another 60, and another 30. This is the only soil of Christ's four soils in this parable that bears any kind of fruit or anything at all. Jesus describes this as a soil as the one who hears the word and he, he grasps it. He understands it. Friends, many people have heard the gospel again and again and again. They've come to church again and again and again. They can name all the pastors that came and left the church, and they've been the faithful few that have been there, and they heard the gospel again and again and again. And then one day, it clicked. Not the fan of snap. One day it clicked. They understood. They saw their righteousness as not as their own, but as alien, as belonging to God. They saw their sin as Christ sees it, as what separates them. They saw the problem of clarity. And they understood, I need Christ. I've been playing church. I've been playing Christ. I've been playing Christian my entire life. I don't know him, but I know him now. And they needed him, and they responded to Christ in faith. And maybe today, even right now, that describes you. You may be thinking there in a, in a different sense. You may be thinking, well, if if I was ever one of these four soils before, do I remain that way? Am I stuck of being the unresponsive soil? Am I stuck of being the one that's choked out by distractions? And the truth is, we, we probably have every soil represented here, as many churches do. But just because you were one soil before doesn't mean that even now the Holy Spirit is moving in, in your heart, moving in someone's heart to regenerate men and make dead men live. If you once heard the gospel and you didn't understand it, it's not over for you. That seed can still be cast once again 
and you can respond to Christ in faith. If you once heard the gospel and you responded with joy initially, but after a time you fizzled, the pressure came and your family and you moved away from church, you stopped coming, you can now once again receive that seed and come to God in submission. If you once heard the gospel and you were just distracted by the love of money, and as what First John says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, you can now hear the transformative power of the gospel and its message and be drawn to the Lord of glory of a contrite heart. Beloved, even, even a non-response to Christ is a response. Matthew 12, 30 says, Christ says, you are the for me or against me. There is no middle ground when it comes to Christ. There is no third option. There is no excluded middle. You're either for Christ or against him. So I'm speaking to you this morning, young people. I'm speaking to you, church family. I'm speaking to you, friends and visitors that are here to celebrate. I'm speaking to you that are just, you're attending, you're just still trying to figure this stuff out. Who is Christ to you? What do you make of Christ? Do you recognize that the power of the gospel is to free you from sin, to make dead men live? Do you see that a life not bearing fruit is a life that's lived outside of Christ? Friends, to, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to respond. Tomorrow may never come for you. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is the day to come to Christ. So come quickly, come earnestly, come broken. Come disheartened, come weak, come disenchanted from your life in sin. Come disenchanted from trying to make it on your own effort. Come disenchanted from faking it. Friends, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You can share the camaraderie of brokenness of other sinners there. It's a place where what people once thought of you, they're like, I thought, I thought so-and-so was saved. It's of no consequence if you've been playing church. Remember, Christ, he took the sin of the world upon himself. He bought his lambs back with his blood. He paid for it definitively, finally. He paid the price of sin once and for all, the very problem that can separate you and me from him, separates everybody from God without Christ's blood. And for those that hear the good news and respond, you will bear much fruit. He who has ears, let him hear. Which soil are you? Have you heard the gospel and walked away indifferently? Have you heard the gospel and you felt a swell of emotion for a time, but you soon walked away when pressure came? Have you heard the gospel but the love of riches or the pursuit of the world came and the world snatched it away? Or have you heard the gospel even now that God sent his son to die for sinners such as you and me. He paid the penalty of death. He tasted the first fruits of the resurrection, satisfying the wrath and the justice of God, displaying the mercy of God so that you may be made right with God and rise again with him. Church, do you bear fruit in keeping with repentance? He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for revealing this truth to us. Lord, we pray that now, Holy Spirit, you move in the hearts of people and you make dead men live. Lord, we pray that if any of those soils describe us outside of the good soil, that you would make us alive in you now. Lord, I pray that we would respond positively. Lord, I pray that if we'd been faking it, we would be convicted in our heart. Lord, I pray that we would be exposed for our hypocrisy. Lord, we thank you. We thank you in the fullness of time that you came and you died on the cross. You paved that pathway to salvation. And you paid for sinners to, with your own blood, Lord. Jesus, we, we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, by your spirit. Amen.